Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, a Voices crossover event. We'll continue the conversation that started on last night's Latino Voices about unity between the black and Latino communities. A throwback examining the killing of Black Panther leader Fred Hampton 51 years later. Governor State University has a new president. Dr. Cheryl Green joins us to discuss racial justice and higher education during the pandemic. And I'm so inspirational, they say to other people that they get up and they try. And a story about never giving up. We introduce you to champion archer Babette Payton and how she's inspiring others to take up the sport. First off tonight, Chicago is famed for its patchwork of neighborhoods, each with their own distinct and often ethnic character. And as we discussed in last night's Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, the boundaries that frame these neighborhoods can also divide. But a new generation of activists and organizers are working to build on past coalitions and bring Chicago's black and brown communities together to end these systemic inequities that have persisted in our city for decades. Joining us once more are Silvia Puente, Executive Director of the Nonpartisan Latino Policy Forum, Berto Aguayo, Executive Director of the Anti-Violence Organization, Increase the Peace, Laura Washington, Chicago Sun-Times columnist and ABC7 political analyst, and Todd Belcourt, Co-Founder and Executive Director of the National Nonprofit Social Change. Welcome again to Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, everyone. Um, so, Todd, let's start with you. What do you believe prevents a strong coalition of Black and Latino communities uh, forming across the communities? I think the most significant thing preventing them from being even stronger is the fact that they're not being covered. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work already being done by Black and Brown communities across the nation that no one ever hears about. And as a result, the only thing you tend to hear about in the media are things kind of focusing on the illusion of scarcity or, or like strategic scapegoating, kind of pitting one race against another. When at the end of the day, when there are tragedies like George Floyd's or Vanessa Guillen or Miguel Vega, uh, you see black and brown people hand in hand uh, protesting, uh, really making their voice heard, saying enough is enough with the exploitation, the abuse and mistreatment, and are really working meaningfully to do things that impact it. And of course, we saw some of that this summer. I think you guys have also talked about that. Berto, let's go to you next. What do the black and Latino communities have in common? <laughs> a lot of things. Uh, and I think it's that realization that we have a lot more things that unite us uh, than that divide us is one of the things that we got to talk more about and act upon those things. When you look at every issue from housing uh, to the economy um, to education attainment levels, um, black and brown communities are all, and even at the pan looking at the pandemic, uh, <laughs> black and brown people are affected the most. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to do is have those honest conversations about both um, the anti-Black sentiment that might exist in the Latino community and the anti-Latino uh, sentiment that exists in certain pockets of the Black community. Talking about that truthfully, act, acting upon the issues that unite us, um, and really having real, honest, truthful dialogue, I think is what is going to enable us to really pave the way for a new era of coalition building among Black and Brown communities. And I want to, we're going to come back to that sentiment that you just mentioned uh, in a little bit as well. Uh, Laura Washington, you know, what's at stake here? What do these two communities have to gain from a strong coalition? Well, clearly, if they unite and they work together, they bring more resources, they bring more constituents, they bring more voices to the table, and therefore more power. It's in the interest of non, uh, of white or non people of color to keep us divided because then they don't have to share the spoils and they, and they, can also exercise control. We have to remember in a city like Chicago, this is a majority minority city. The, our Chicago City Council is a majority minority city council. We already have the power in our hands that we just need to realize that and find common issues. I think COVID-19 would be a, an excellent example to start with. Those, the, what's happening with the pandemic is, is deeply affecting both of our communities. And, and, and given that there's never gonna be enough resources to address all of the 
problems around health care and immigration and, and, and housing, we need to we need to combine our, 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 our efforts and our army. Sylvia Puente, how pervasive would you say anti-black racism is in the Latino community? I definitely think it's a concern, and I think it's definitely a concern not necessarily among the younger generation, but among many of our Spanish-speaking immigrants who haven't had as much exposure, I think, to African-American communities and to understanding that we do have much more in common than divides us. I think um, there are, as to what Todd's point, I think there are a lot of initiatives that are being put forth to really address this issue. The Latino Policy Forum has a leadership academy that brings together Black and, and Latino community leaders where they are talking about and they're hosting conversations about how do we deal with anti-blackness in the Latino community. But to, to Berto's point, it's gotta be a mutual conversation because we certainly have seen the pockets of outrage of perceived competition between Latinos and blacks for jobs and what and immigrants, you know, immigrants go home. Um, so there's a lot of work, I think, to really promote understanding uh, in both of our communities. And Todd, you know, sort of the flip side of that question and to Sylvia's point, how pervasive would you say that anti-immigrant uh, sentiment is within the black community and, and how does it link to the job market? Well, I think at the end of the day, Brandis, no ethnicity has a monopoly on bias. I mentioned that before and I really want to reiterate that. I mean, it is ubiquitous and there's no question that it exists in all communities. I think the question is why is it only highlighted and really propounded in such a significant way when it relates to the black and brown communities? I think if more was done to celebrate what's being done to indicate and showcase the unification, all the things done together, and to get to what Sylvia mentioned is the increased exposure. I mean, segregation is a significant reason why there aren't more in, innate uh, coalitions built because the distance is there. You're, you're not in a neighborhood where you see other people who don't look like you. So it's easier for, for those sorts of uh, stereotypes to manifest and, and really fester and, and create animosity. And it's easier then to stoke flames of anti-other sentiment, when at the end of the day, as you see in these protests, as you see in some of the work we're doing even down here in Georgia, the Black and Brown Coalitions right now through social change, uh, we do recognize we are in this together and a lot of people, uh, the vast majority in fact, are fighting together hand in hand to, for our common liberation. It's just not being covered the way it should be. And then certainly there is some pockets of it as, as uh, Berto mentioned, but I think at the end of the day, the exposure is a key and the media coverage is a key to really dismantling that. And, and I also think we also haven't talked enough about how some of it is generational because it really is generational based on exposure and proximity, right? I mean, we, we now see some really great examples, for example, the Little Village High School, which brings in students from North Lawndale and South Lawndale so that they are studying together, growing up together. But I do think that, you know, we're definitely seeing more universality among our younger generation then I will say, you know, I'm a baby boomer, you know, just to, you know, when you look at my, in my generation, I think in both the black and Latino community, there just hasn't been as much, much exposure, which leads to, you know, so it is quote unquote fear of the other. Um, so it is, how do we overcome that? How do we combat that? And I really uh, have to give hats off because I think our youth and our younger generation are leading the way in teaching us what the universal, universality in our shared humanity really looks like. And Berto, you know, Sylvia just mentioned it, sort of this generational difference in attitudes towards blacks and Latinos. Does that exist? Do you see that? Uh, I, I would say definitely. Uh, I think more and more um, younger and younger folks are realizing that in order for black and Latino communities to succeed, uh, we need to be working together to fight the system that's oppressing us both instead of each other. And evidence of that is uh, what happened in the aftermath of the riots that sparked a lot of racial tension. You saw black and brown youth organizing black and brown unity rallies. We organized black and brown unity food pantries. Uh, we even organized a black and brown unity car parade that brought together hundreds of black and brown folks on the south side of Chicago, waving around Pan-African flags, Mexican flags, Colombian flags to show that in order for us to succeed, our, our liberation is intertwined because of all the issues that we face. Um, we can only win them if we unite and get together. And to Laura's point, you know, the Burks, the Trumps of the world, um, there's people in positions of power who benefit out of pitting communities of color against each other. And I think more young people are realizing that we need to break those barriers, have those honest conversations and act together um, so that we can succeed in, in the 21st century.
so much to get to, but unfortunately we are out of time. I do look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you sometime in the future. Our thanks to Sylvia Puente, Berto Aguayo, Laura Washington, and Todd Belcor for joining us. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thanks for having us. Thank you. 51 years ago, the chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton, was shot to death by Chicago police in his home. In tonight's throwback from 2005, Rich Samuels examines the conflicting narratives about Hampton's killing propagated by Chicago news media. As early as eight hours after the death of Fred Hampton, there were two contradictory accounts about what really happened during the course of the police raid. On the one hand, the Panthers and their supporters claimed that Fred Hampton was murdered. On the other hand, there was the account resolutely defended by state's attorney Edward Hanrahan. The account that we made public yesterday gives a detailed explanation of what happened in that apartment. Uh, I stand wholeheartedly behind it as absolutely accurate. In an atmosphere supercharged by the competitive nature of Chicago journalists, a battle of headlines paralleled the conflicting accounts of the police raid. I urge, I urge your inventory of each of these vicious weapons. Nobody, I have never denied that there were no weapons there. As a matter of fact, he would be a fool if he didn't have a weapon there. A week after Hampton's death, State's Attorney Hanrahan gave the Tribune an exclusive. Photos purporting to show bullet holes left after the Panthers directed a barrage at the police. Why was the uh, disclosure made in the Chicago Tribune? Because the, that newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, in my opinion, gave a very balanced, fair report of the events that occurred. And Henry had his lied before and he's going to lie again. That, that hole that he's blown up in the paper is a, a, a hole of a nail. Right close up of a nail head. Journalists who visited the scene concluded the holes were indeed made by nails rather than bullets. The results of a special federal grand jury probe were released early in 1970. The grand jury did not recommend prosecution, though it supported the Panther version of the raid. They had a, a, a ballistics expert who came down and analyzed all of these bullets, and he, and he made the conclusion from a ballistic point of view that there were 99 shots fired by the police and perhaps one by the Panthers, and that was your shootout. Uh, but what happened was, as they got more and more into this investigation, uh, they started to realize that the feds themselves were involved. Panther Minister of Defense Bobby Rush became a Chicago alderman and then a United States congressman. One wonders what might have become of Fred Hampton had he lived. You could see him as, as, as any, everything from a, a political leader, a, a community leader, a lawyer. I mean, he just was a tremendously talented and, and brilliant young man. He said, but you have to remember one thing, and that's be strong. He wasn't afraid of anything. Starting a new job is always demanding, but when that job is university president and the year is 2020, it comes with a few more challenges than most jobs. Challenges like educating 5,000 students during a pandemic and leading a racially diverse institution through a year of racial reckoning. And for the last few months, those tasks and more have been the charge of Governor State University's new president, Dr. Cheryl Green, who joins us now to talk about her vision for GSU. Dr. Green, congrats on the new position. I know you've been in it for a few months now. Um, and your tenure began in the summer, as we said, in the middle of a pandemic. Where was Governor State, you know, in its shift to remote learning when you arrived? And how's it been going since then? You know, I started approximately July 1, 2020, so I've been in the role just around five months, and it has been an incredible journey to start as president during a pandemic. But I was fortunate to step into the role and join a team of professionals who are faculty and staff who gave a lot of energy and thought to planning and developing ways that there would be continuity of instruction. Everyone rallied, everyone pulled together, everyone put the needs of the students at the forefront of their planning and their focus. And, and I think so, and most great. of your students right now, you are all doing mostly um, remote learning with the exception of some classes, of course, those that have to be done in person. 
Do you anticipate a return to in-person learning in spring 2021? Absolutely. As we monitor the landscape for what's happening with the COVID-19 rates in the state of Illinois and in our region, and as we liaison with the Department of Public Health and listen to the guidance by the governor's office, we are putting the safety and the well-being of the students in the campus at the forefront. And so our spring will look almost identical to the fall where 80% of our classes will be remote or online and about 10% will be what's called hybrid and another 10% may be in person because there are just a select few classes that have to be taught in very small groups with social distancing and other protocols in person. And you know, as the president, what is your vision uh, for GSU in the coming years? You know what, I'm excited to uh, advance a vision that includes promoting the academic excellence that exists on the campus. I wanna find ways to promote uh, research and academic instruction and high impact practices for retaining students and promoting their graduation and their persistence in their academic programs. I have taken it on as a personal mission to remove the common hidden gem reference to GSU. I don't want us to be hidden and we won't be hidden. We are a jewel of the Southland. And so I plan to promote greater visibility and community engagement for the university. And last but not least, I want our students to have an amazing and optimized campus experience. And with my student affairs training, I will be able to infuse that through our academic experience at the university. Now, the university, you all also have a history that is rooted in racial integration, um, and you sit in a largely black community. Um, how did the university respond to the protests during the reckoning over the summer? Well, you know, uh, we have a social justice institute at Governor State University, and the faculty and the staff were engaged in teaching about equity and inclusiveness and uh, the importance of diversity in our society through curriculum, through seminars, through lectures, and through community service. Also, you know, I want to expand as a part of my vision that Social Justice Institute to include um, a focus on the performing arts, it needs to include uh, a legal clinic for our students, and it needs to include scholarly research on that topic. When it comes to what we did for the community, many of our students, along with faculty, went out into the community during the chaos to help communities rebuild, to help communities be restored, and to you know be of service and to help promote healing and transformation to those communities. And that's what we should be about at Governor's State. What would you like to see out of the new Biden administration with regards to support for higher education? You know, the Biden administration and his cabinet, I am confident will be focused on providing more access to higher ed for underrepresented and underserved students. Many college students enter this domain with uh, loans and high debt. And so affordability is one of the greatest deterrents to completing a college education. So I am very hopeful and even confident that they will focus on this need for college students and help the universities restore, you know, their pre-COVID. Uh, best of luck to you. Sorry, Dr. Green, we're actually out of time, but best of luck to you in your new position. We look forward to having you back. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. There's more Chicago Tonight Black Voices ahead, but first to Paris Shuts and a look at what's on tap this week. Brandis, we've got a lot planned on Chicago Tonight. We hear from essential workers who've been relying on public transit throughout the pandemic. And he has a gas-powered paintbrush. Meet a man who's been making art with a chainsaw for 40 years. That's this week at 7 here on 11. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. 
About four months ago, Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia visited an urban garden on the south side where young people were organizing open mics. On his way there, he met Babette Payton, a local athlete with an inspiring story. For our latest Chicago portrait, we profile Archer Babette Payton. Every second of the day, thank you God, I want to tell you that I love you. I want to tell you that I'm thinking of you every minute, every hour. Every second of the day, how you doing? I love you, come on! A few times a week, 68-year-old Babette Payton feeds the turkeys and rooster at a community garden in the south side neighborhood of Auburn Gresham. They all got some, I, I gotta look at their mouths. Who ain't got nothing, everybody got some. All right, praise God, good seeing you. Babette lives nearby in a low-income apartment building for veterans. Usually I see a little cat jump out, the cat will even go into the garden. While in the military, Babette sustained an injury that eventually resulted in paralysis. Yes, the injury has got me in pain, causes me to fall, okay? And then this, it, it, it progressed to a stroke, which actually ended me up, got me, ended up in a wheelchair since 2009. At that time, the U.S. Army veteran thought her life was over. I was told I was, the next stop for me was the hospice. So at that time I was able to write, I wrote my obituary. And when the military came and said they wanted to take me to a military Paralympic sports camp and wrote Newport, Rhode Island, I thought, well, this is my last hurrah. I may as well go. An archery coach taught her how to shoot using her teeth. After her first two arrows missed the target, she fired four more without noticing where they landed. My aide helped load the other four. I shot all six of them, so now I'm finished, right? He said, look this way, Miss Payton. And I looked that way, and people were jumping up, and I said, oh, what's, what's their problem? He said, you got two bulls. I said, me? Me? I got two bulls. Oh! You know, you go crazy. Since then, Babette, who only 10 years ago experienced homelessness, has traveled the world to compete. But I got 156 medals. My highest score is 299 over 300, shooting from my wheelchair with my mouth. Babette's currently unable to shoot because her bow broke in 2019 during a competition in Ohio. So we visited the Croc Center, where the Chicago Archery Club is giving lessons. How did you knock your arrows? She asked me how do I knock my arrows. Knocking the arrows is actually putting it into the bow before you shoot it. Babette hopes to raise enough money to buy a compound bow. Chicago Archery Club President Clyde Thompson says the two south side ranges they normally use are not wheelchair accessible, but he hopes to change that for the outdoor range in Washington Park. We have been promised at our outdoor range a ramp that would make it accessible for her to be able to get in and use the facilities. And hopefully we will get that in place in the uh, early part of the spring. And we're looking forward to Babette coming out and practice, practice with us if she's not on an international tournament tour. Through gospel radio and TV appearances, as well as church and community speaking engagements, Babette spreads her message, don't doubt yourself. Okay, now here, I'm using a mouth tail, one arm, and shooting. Did I start to think about that? At first, yes, because I'm like, I can't do this. Everybody's using two hands. But now that I can, I mean, do I win all the time? Nope. But you know, I win so much. And I'm so inspirational, they say to other people, that they get up and they try. And I said, that's all that's required. Don't worry about where your arrow hits, just shoot at it. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Evan Garcia. In the U.S. Army, Peyton served overseas as a trauma specialist rehabilitating wounded soldiers on their way back home. Visit our website for more on her story and information on how to help her get that new archery equipment. Chicago lost an icon this week. Jerry Oliver, owner of the legendary Bronzeville venue Jerry's Palm Tavern, died this past Monday. She was 101 years old. In 1987, WTTW special, Oliver talked about taking over the Palm Tavern from Bronzeville businessman James Knight in 1956. Here's a clip. Mr. Knight turned the Palm Tavern over to my husband and I. And uh, we did what we could with it. And the area at that time was going to a, through a transition and all the in people, all the people with money, all the people who were about, they were forsaken 47th Street because immigration had taken its toll and everybody was, uh, you know, seeking the 
the beauty of immigration. There is a need until someone comes that could perpetuate what Mr. Knight was about in his era, what I'm about in my era. That is good in an era for, for positiveness uh, following me. But I'm waiting for the carrier of the torch to come and take over. Sadly, no one did come along to claim that legacy, and the Palm Tavern closed in 2001. But Oliver was memorialized by Chicago blues man and Oliver's close friend, Billy Branch, in 2014. Branch recorded the song, Going to See Miss Jerry One More Time, for his album, Blues Shock. You can find a link to that song on our website. And that's our show for this Sunday night. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com news, for the very latest from WTTW News, including a guide for things to know about the state's plan for a COVID-19 vaccine. And join Paris Schutz and me tomorrow at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.